and I work at the Wash County Sheriff's Office in the Forensic Science Division. I am a criminalist too, and currently I am the acting DNA technical leader for the uh, DNA section, meaning that I'm technically responsible for all technical aspects of the DNA and CODIS sections. This presentation will go over a little bit of my personal background. They asked me to kind of give you guys an overview of how I got to where I am today. And then my experience in college and in the biotechnology program, my life a little bit after college and how I ended up at the Washoe County Crime Lab. And then I have some fun hands-on activities. I'll do some blood testing demos for you guys. And then you guys have some DNA packets where you get to actually do some DNA analysis, which is pretty cool. And then I also have case file review, time permitting. I have three cases that have been adjudicated within our community that happened. And we're going to go over those case files and show you how DNA actually aided in those investigations. So a little bit about me. Um, I was actually born in Germany. My father was in the army, and so my, they were stationed in Germany, and that's where I'm from. And I only stayed until I was about two, and so I don't remember it, and I don't speak German. Sorry. <laughs> There's, I can't say anything fun. And then of all places in the world that we could have moved to after my dad was in the military, he chose Nevada because they're from here. And of all the wonderful places that I could have grown up in the state of Nevada, I grew up in Cold Springs. Is anybody from Cold Springs? No? Okay, so I am a bit of a homegrown girl. Um, back in the day, Cold Springs had like a Chuck Circle C and a 7-Eleven, and then we got a skate park in middle school. We thought that was really cool. So we didn't have a whole lot to do out there. Um, and then I went to Nancy Gomes Elementary, O'Brien Middle School, and then North Valley's High School. So from there, I actually went here at the University of Nevada, Reno. This is me on graduation. When I was at the university, I actually started as pre-dental. I thought that I wanted to be a dentist pretty much from the time I was 12 until I got into college. Um, and I went the biology route, and then I started a dental internship. And I have to tell you, this probably saved my life. I got on with a dentist office here in town. And I decided this is not something that I could do for the rest of my life. There's no way I could fill cavities day in and day out. Like, this was just not for me. So um, at that point, I kind of didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was a little bit lost. I was going to be a junior in college. And I hate to say this, but I was kind of sleeping through my cell bio class. And there was a presentation um, about the biotechnology program. And Dr. Shintani came in and talked about the program. It's a five-year program here at the university. And you get both of your undergraduate and graduate degree at the same time. And so for an extra year, I got a master's degree out of the deal. And the biotechnology program, I can't say enough about it. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, you are required to do a lot of hands-on lab work for that program. And so I did my research stint in the Clark Lab here at the university. So conventional biotechnology, as you guys would recognize it, um, that was done like through selective breeding, how we took wolves and ended up with the dogs that we have and can call our friends. Uh, selective breeding is also done um, to create the fruit and vegetables that we all love, those giant strawberries that we actually just had in the back of the room. They don't grow naturally that size. So through selective breeding and through um, molecular biotechnology, we actually have engineered these products that we all love and enjoy. And so molecular biotechnology is genetically modifying any organism or a component of that organism or cells and proteins to generate a desired product. So what exactly does that mean? Have you guys heard of GMOs? Yeah, a lot of people won't eat GMOs or genetically modified organisms, right? So GMO is a genetically modified organism. And what it means, essentially, is that you're taking a gene from one, organize, uh, one organism and utilizing it in another organism for an end product. And so one really good example is there is a type of fish that can withstand freezing temperatures in the ocean. And they found the gene that does that, and they've put it into strawberries. And so strawberries can now withstand early and late frosts. And so you can grow strawberries a whole lot longer. Okay? And so the biotech program, um, really what it did is it gave me exposure to all of the techniques that would be utilized to do this type of work. And as you'll see later, you can take those techniques and utilize them in so many different areas. Um, I got exposure to all sorts of different things that really kind of set me up great for working at the crime lab. Another visual example of biotechnology is, have you guys gone to like an aquarium and done the jellyfish and you hit the light and they all glow in the dark and they're super beautiful? Well, the reason why they do that is called green fluorescent protein, and they've actually taken that gene from the jellyfish and put it into other organisms like this lovely mouse, and then they too can also be fluorescent under UV light. Okay. 
So I utilized the power of GFP when I was at the university working in the Clark, in the Clark lab. Um, I did my research work on the development of the nervous system. And specifically, once a cell becomes part of this nervous system, I was really interested in how does that cell remember for the whole lifetime that that's what its job is and that that's its, what it's supposed to do or its identity. So I studied uh, maintenance of cellular fate. And I did this with um, nematodes, which are a microscopic worm. I know it sounds like really kind of lame, but I engineered like teenage mutant you know, ninja worms. So I thought it was really cool. And then my life after college, so like I said, I had actually a really small graduating class from the program. I graduated in 2011. Um, we had 12 graduates that year. A few of my friends went into PhD programs in various fields, and there are three that at the time that I graduated got jobs here in town um, for like the Vitamin Research Institute, Sierra Sciences, and Synthetic Genomics. And then a few of them went to either medical or clinical laboratories. There's a few that work at the Renown Laboratory. And then one individual joined the armed forces, and one was also accepted into pharmacy school. And so I think it's, you're probably all thinking that's great that this is what your friends did, but like, what did you do? So how do I fit in in this? My path was a little bit more unconventional than my friends. I got accepted to do a PhD program to the University of Alabama Huntsville, and I ended up declining because they didn't have funding for me, and then I was kind of fighting to get funding, and the school got hit by tornadoes. And so there like, wasn't a whole lot of funding for me at all. <laughs> so I declined going to UAH. And then um, Dr. Clark gracious, graciously gave me a job as his lab tech. Um, and so I worked there for a while. And then I was a tanning consultant. No joke, I worked at um, a tanning salon here in town. And I kind of was just trying to figure out like what I wanted to do. And I got a great teaching assistantship. It's called a letter of appointment um, for the biochem class 406 here on campus. And I really loved that job. And I worked with the students. And then ironically, like sometimes I just think that you're in the right place at the right time. And my job actually found me. And so I got an email saying that the Washoe County Crime Lab was looking for an individual who had graduated in a degree that they had experience in all the techniques that they utilized, but that they would be willing to work part-time and basically kind of be a little bit of a glorified lab tech. I would do like their QC work, um, I had administrative duties, and so that's how I started at the crime lab. I applied for that job, I got on, and within a few months they actually had a position open for a criminalist position. And so I applied and I got accepted into the DNA unit where I became a primary examiner first and then a DNA anal um, analyst. And currently, like I said, I'm the acting DNA technical leader. So you don't always have to have a plan. And sometimes your plan, like me, I wanted to be a dentist. thought that was what I wanted. It doesn't always work that way. So a little bit about the forensic science division. I think we're the best group of people I've ever known. Um, they say that the people that you work with can make or break your job. And I swear there's not a single person that I work with that I dislike. I love everybody in the crime lab. We're a fantastic group of people. Um, we, do, we are a full service crime lab, but today I'm only going to focus on the biology unit, which is where I work. So we have an evidence section, we have a forensic investigation section, and latent prints, and that's the section that you guys know as CSI, like the TV show CSI, that's, that's what they do. Um, firearms and tool mark section, trace evidence, controlled substances, breath alcohol, and toxicology. And then of course the biology unit, which has a special little place in my heart. This is our biology unit. It consists of primary exam, DNA, and CODIS, and we're pretty fantastic, and we like to have a lot of fun. We have big competitions to get the Scaredy Cat Award at Halloween, and this is us a few years ago. We go all out. We were toy soldiers. Like, we are all about Halloween. So we have a really serious job, but we're a really fun group of people, and we like to just, you know, whenever we can, we like to have a good time. So. So first I'll talk about primary exam screening. Um, first and foremost, primary exam is a visual examination of the item. During that time, in my notes, I'll note the physical description and the condition of the item that I received it in. And then from there, I'm basically identifying stains and hairs, and those stains are gonna be bodily fluids. Mostly we're asked to look for blood and semen, and then also saliva testing. If those stains or hairs are identified, we preserve them and forward them onto DNA for further analysis to see if we can see who they belong to. Typical items that we examine are swabs from crime scenes, victim and suspect sexual assault kits, clothing, bedding, weapons, carpets, and vehicles. 
Vehicles is kind of a fun one. We have a full garage bay that they can bring vehicles in and put them on like a, um, a platform that rises up and we can look underneath them to see like if it's a hit and run case. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. One of the aids that we utilize in the lab is the stereo microscope. As you can imagine, we have like big bulky items and a lot of times we're looking for very small pieces of evidence and so it's hard for us with just the naked eye to actually see this. So to give you an idea of just how much magnification we get with this and how useful it is in investigation, um, this is a shoe and it's kind of washed out with the projector but there's a little bit of staining down here and overall like the shoe's in decent kind of worn condition, it's not too dirty and there's not a whole lot of staining. But when you go ahead and utilize the stereo microscope, you can actually see this small red-brown stain that may or may not be blood, and it could be totally probative to the case. And this is actually the stitching on one of those loops that the laces goes through. So you get a huge amount of magnification. That's really helpful for the case. We do a few different types of tests within the um, primary exam section. Presumptive tests are tests that indicate the presence of biological samples, and they're quick and sensitive, but they're not 100% specific for the fluid in question, um, which means that while we get a positive, it could also test positive with other substances. And the one that I'll show you guys here in just a minute um, is a test for blood, but it will also test positive with rust and a few other things. So it's a great indication of the substance in question, but it's not 100% confirmatory. And so we use these presumptive tests for blood and human blood, semen and saliva. And then we do have confirmatory tests that do verify the presence um, of a substance, but we have a, a lot less of those types of tests than more presumptive. Yeah? So her question was, do the presumptive tests work on animals as well? And that's a fantastic question. So yes, so the test that I'm going to actually show you guys, it will test positive for blood, and that could be human blood, dog blood, cab blood, um, any of those substances. Does that make sense? Um, an interesting one I didn't put in here, but since you ask, I'll tell you about it. We do have um, a test that will give us a positive for human or higher primate blood, and that's important because here in the state of Nevada, we have a lot of hunters. And so we'll get calls in from people out hiking like, oh my gosh, I totally found a murder scene. There's all this blood in the desert. I, there's got to be a body somewhere. You have to come out here. So they'll go out and they'll collect samples and then it'd be a total waste of money for us to process that all the way through DNA. So we'll run a hematrace test first. And it kind of looks like an at-home pregnancy test. And you add the sample and if it gets a positive, it's either a human or a higher primate. So like, or a ferret. So it's either a human or a really big ferret out there. So. <laughs> So the test that we utilize most often in the lab for blood testing is called the Castlemeyer or phenolphthalein test. It relies on the presence of hemoglobin, which is found in the blood, and produces a color change reaction to indicate a positive result. And it's actually quite an easy test to perform. You take a filter paper and you fold it in half twice, creating like a pie. And you take that sharp point and you scratch it against the stain in question. And then you add a drop of the first solution and then a drop of the second solution and this hot pink color change is indicative of the presence of blood. However, as you can imagine at a crime scene, carrying around a bunch of glass vials, especially like if you're totally out in the boondocks, is not a great idea. So at the crime scene, you're not gonna wanna have a bunch of those glass vials hanging around. So they use what's called the hemostix test, and it too produces a color change reaction to indicate a positive result. And this is what it looks like. These were actually created for the medical field um, as a dipstick test to see if there was blood in patient's urine. And so we, we still utilize it. You add a little bit of water to a sterile swab, and then you press it against the stain in question, and then you add it to your hemostick, and a color change, this blue color, would indicate the presence of blood. So we're going to do a couple. Do I have a volunteer? Okay, come on up. Sure, if you guys want to come up, you're more than welcome to. Run a test? Yeah, do you want to yeah. do it? Okay, so put on some gloves, because one of these, or more of these, is actually human blood, so make sure you wear some gloves. So the first thing I'm gonna do while she's getting ready is we always wanna run a positive control. So you wanna make sure that the reagents that you're actually using are gonna test positive with blood. So the first thing I'm gonna do is this is sheep's blood that we utilize as a positive control. All right, so what we do is we just wanna swab one of these and we wanna get some color transfer. See the color transfer? Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna press this against the yellow pad. 
You do have to hold it up to a minute if you're not getting any results because it could take a while to react, but as you can see, we get like an almost instantaneous with the sheep's blood, okay? So we know our reagents are working, so we can go ahead and then test the samples in question, okay? Which one of these do you guys think is actually blood? Four? <coughs> Someone said three? You think two? Okay, do you want to do the first test or do you want me to? Uh, I'll do it. Okay, so go ahead and here's your swab. We can just go in order if you want. Yeah, if you want to start with two. So scrub that until you get some good color transfer. So go ahead and hold that and then you're going to press them together. So why do you guys use sheep's blood for your control instead of a different animal's blood? We had it on stock. It's a little bit easier to obtain than asking someone to go <laughs> give us some, some blood. We do have people that will regularly have their blood drawn for various reasons, and they'll ask, it kind of is weird to ask the nurse, hey, can I keep a vial of my own blood? But they usually will let them. Um, but yeah, we can get larger stocks of beef and sheep from various places around town. Let's see what you got. All right, we got negative. So um, you can get a range of reactions. And so let's say it's a really, really diluted blood sample. You might just get a little bit of a speckling. That'd be a weak positive. And then that really dark color chain is a strong positive or strong indication. There we go. OK, here's number three. You ready? Okay. All right. So they're, both it. they're both it. There was only one negative. I think that one is like spicy ketchup or something. <laughs> and then if you want to just fold your gloves inside each other, you can put them right back in there. So that's how steam hemostics work. As you can see, it's really quick. It's super easy for them to use out at a crime scene. If there's a stain that looks kind of questionable, they're like, oh, do we want to collect this? Do we not? They can run a hemostics test. And then because hemostics is actually not as specific um, for blood as the Castlemire, the Castlemire is the most specific that we run. Anything that they get a hemostics positive in the field with will rerun the phenol failing test back at the lab. Are yeah. tests more expensive than others? More expensive? Um, yes and no. So these, I believe, don't quote me on this, I think these are fairly cheap. Um, but then to make the phenol failing, it's actually more time that is what is costly. We have to like, like reflux the whole reaction and we have to like reserve a hood and make sure that chemistry can let us go in there. And then, yeah. So it's a little bit more intensive to make that one. Okay. All right, any more questions about this one? Okay, we'll continue. I think everyone's favorite test of all time when it comes to blood, especially on TV and in person, like, and totally when you do it with like detectives and stuff, is luminol testing. Everyone loves luminol. Luminol is the one that you see on CSI where they come in in the middle of the night and they have all the lights turned off and they spray the chemical and the room just like lights up, right? And like, oh, there's blood everywhere. So everyone loves luminol. Luminol is fantastic because it reacts with blood and results in the production of light. The chemical is sprayed, allowing for a large area to be screened at once. The downside is that we usually have to do this like 8 o'clock at night. So where if it's a big area that we have to screen, if we're looking for a crime scene, we could be there super, super late. Um, the other downside to luminol is that it, is, um, it will also react with certain cleaning reagents, certain paints, and certain metal products. And so if you can imagine, we're usually screening you know, a home or carpets, and people tend to like to clean up blood scenes with bleach and bleach reacts with luminol. So a big chunk of our training when it comes to luminol is to understand or know the difference between it reacting with a cleaning product and it reacting with blood. And so the difference is that when you first spray luminol on bleach, it is like a color extravaganza light show. It is like, and then it all dies out. Whereas blood, it'll, uh, flir or it'll uh, chemiluminesce and then it intensifies. So luminol is super fun. It's fun when you first spray it, everyone's like, oh, there's blood, and then you wait. Yeah. His question was, does luminol eventually stop reacting? Like, how long can I use it for? And it's 15 minutes. So once I mix the two solutions together, I have 15 minutes of reactivity because luminol will actually start to kind of react with itself. And so by the end, your bottle is starting to kind of luminesce as well, and you don't want that. You don't want to spray an already glowing product on, on a scene. Her question is, is there any test that we run that you would actually destroy the sample in order to perform it? And the answer is no. So all of these testing, as you saw with the, um, 
the swabs, we actually test away from the stain itself. I never stick the hemostics on the stain. I always take a little portion for myself and test. Um, we always want to maintain the integrity of the stain. So luminol with spraying it directly on, everyone always wonders, does this dilute it so much? Does it ruin the DNA evidence? And no, it does not. It'll, we can still get a DNA profile. Her question is, do you have to use a specific camera to capture this reaction? And you don't have to use a specific camera, but there are specific techniques, and the crime scene unit actually does that for us. So her question is, let's say they bleach this whole crime scene. How do you collect that versus what you're actually looking for? And it's a fantastic question. It takes a lot of training to, like, to do that. And so it's a matter <clears throat> of understanding how it's supposed to react with bleach, how it's supposed to react with blood, and kind of it just is like scene by scene. And so, I mean, if you spray an area and you have two glowing, gorgeous spots, I mean, that's like a fantastic humdinger. Like, you want to collect those. Um, is there a possibility that's a stain from like a paint or something reacting? Like, it's not actually diluted blood, sure. But we do bring those back in and we try and use the phenylphthalein test and we'll, you know, we'll end up running them through DNA. But generally speaking, when you see that, I mean, this is a gorgeous uh, crime scene indication. Okay? So this is that wall without any treatment, and that's how it looks to the naked eye. I mean, to the naked eye, that looks really clean. We did a fantastic job on the cleanup. And then when you spray the luminol, you can see those trace dilutions of the blood in the texture of the wall. And then what's really interesting, if it's in carpet, sometimes they'll actually collect like a chunk of the carpet. And then when you use the stereo microscope and you zoom into the carpet fibers at the bottom, you can see the red-brown staining. Yeah. So her question is, when it tests positive for luminol, do you do more tests? Right, is that what your question? If we can, yes. So sometimes with the luminol, you'll spray, and then after you've sprayed and you like swab, your swabs, you might actually see visible light red-brown staining, because now you've kind of concentrated it onto a swab. And then if it's visible, we could retest with phenylphthalein testing at the lab. Sometimes it's not, and we might just go ahead and forward it through DNA. And so there's a variety of tests that we run for semen, but I think the one that everybody gets kind of all excited about, especially like on the TV shows, is the utilization of UV lights or alternative light sources to identify semen stains. As you can imagine, we get a lot of bedding and comforters in, and so to screen those really large items and try and find a fluid that's not as readily visible is quite difficult. So the UV lights actually help us a lot to identify those. And so as you can see here, this is an alternative light source, and then this is UV, and this is a semen stain, and it really does fluoresce like you see on on television. So then talking about hair identification, everyone, when I actually started the crime lab and I heard I was going to be identifying hairs, I thought, hairs? Like hair is hair. How am I going to know the difference between a dog or whatever? Um, and it's actually crazy. There's a ton of characteristics about hair that you can utilize to say um, whether or not it's human or animal, and then actually what type of the body it came from. And so if you look here, this is an example of a dog hair, and this is an example of a human hair. And can anybody pick out what the kind of biggest difference is between these two pictures? The dog hair root is like a needle point. It's like tapered, whereas the human hair root is bulbous. So if I saw a hair and it had a tapered root, that would indicate to me that this is not human hair. Okay? And then, like I said, there are much more characteristics other than just that, but that's one pretty quick and easy one is to look at the roots of hairs. And then another characteristic is what's called buckling. It's really hard to see with this photo for you guys, but what this is is it's almost like a clear kind of bubble in the hair, and it's like the hair is kinking or turning in on itself, and that's called buckling. And that is a good characteristic, or a characteristic of it being a pubic hair versus a head hair. Head hair will not have that buckling effect. And then what we're really interested in, we're actually not interested in the hair shaft. We're interested in the hair root. And the reason being is that um, the DNA section does nuclear DNA testing and not mitochondrial. And so mitochondrial testing can be done with the hair shaft and nuclear can be done with the root. And especially if there's skin tags, like a fleshy skin piece attached to the root, that's fantastic for DNA testing. Once we find and identify the stain, so here's a red-brown stain here that tested pH is phenolphthalein, so for blood, blood positive. We will go ahead and remove that stain. And to see how it's labeled twice, A1 and A1, if this is the first item in a case, we call it A. And then the first stain that I collect from that item, I call it 1. And then 2, 3, and 4. So it's A1 shirt stain. 
So I'll cut this out and you can actually see where I tested, cut right through there so that when I get to court and I have to match this back to the main item that it came from, you can actually see where I cut straight through and collected my stain from. And then what we do is there's no way that our evidence storage could actually keep all of the evidence that we've ever looked at. And so we want to send the big bulky items back to the agencies and we want to keep the stains that we actually tested. So I will make a new item of evidence and give it its own unique barcode here. And then I'll write where it came from and then my date and my initials and the lab number it's associated with. And it's much easier to file a whole bunch of coin envelopes than it is to file a whole bunch of bedding or clothing. And so this is what we'll keep for future testing. So then once you find and preserve those lovely stains, we get to send them through DNA and figure out who the heck they belong to or who was the source of them. And so sources of DNA evidence are blood, semen, saliva, urine, hair, teeth, bone, tissue, and sweat. And the awesome thing about DNA is that all DNA from one person will be the same regardless of what cells it came from. And so we might get a blood stain at a crime scene and we compare it to what's called a buccal um, reference standard which is the swabbing of the inside of the cheek of the suspect in question. So it'll be the same just because one's his blood or one's his saliva. We'll get the same profile. So basically what we end up doing is we take our blood stain and we generate a DNA profile. And this one's actually hard to see. You guys have a packet of some better ones, so we'll, we'll get there. Um, but this is what it looks like. And when I first heard DNA profile, I thought, ooh, it's gonna be so cool looking. Like I bet it's all colorful and fancy. And then I was like, oh, it's a lot of peaks and numbers. So what it is is, well, I'll, I'll go on and then we'll come back to it. But this is what a DNA profile looks like, peaks and numbers and locations. So how we do that is we take our blood stain or hair root or saliva or tissue and we take a very, very small portion. We need hardly anything these days. Our kits are so sensitive to do this. We don't need very much at all. And we'll run it through a series of chemical processes and then we will isolate the DNA. We're gonna run that through the chemical process and isolate out DNA. As you can imagine, because we're using such a small amount of the starting sample, we don't get very much DNA out of it. So what we have to do is we have to make more of it for ourselves. Have you guys heard of polymerase chain reaction or PCR? I've got some nods, yeah, okay. So we run what's called polymerase chain reaction and it is um, a faithful rep uh, replication of our starting material and it's really cool, it amplifies it, meaning that it exponentially, so you start with two, and you go to four, and then you go to 16, and 32, and so on and so forth, and after so many cycles, like 28 cycles of this process, you have a whole lot of DNA that you can work with from a very small starting amount, okay? And a lot of people think that like, when I get your DNA profile, I can like know all this stuff about you, like what your eye color is, and how tall you are, and what your race is. I don't know any of that. I can't know any of it. So what we're actually looking at is not your entire genome. We are just looking at short tandem repeats, or STRs. And what that is, is it's a sequence of DNA at a very specific location that everyone will have. So this is Jack, and Jack's STR at this location is AATG. And Jack repeats this four times on the chromosome he inherited from his mom, and six times on the chromosome he inherited from his dad. So his STR profile at this single location is a 4-6. And STRs are great because they are variable between individuals. So where Jack is a 4-6, Jill might be a 2-3, okay? You can have two individuals at one location have the same uh, profile, but over all of the locations that we look at, you're not going to have two people unless the identical twins have the exact same numbers at every single location. Okay? So what we end up doing next, I think, is the funnest part of my job. I take my DNA profile and I put it into a table like this. So from the first location, this is one of those STRs that we're interested in looking at. It's called D19. And we put it into location one. So we take the whole profile. And then we have a sex determining location. So XY is what? Male. Male, good job. XX would be? Female, okay. So we take the profile and we put it in a table. And then what we do is we compare the profile obtained from our piece of evidence to profiles obtained from reference standards. So those buckle swabs of either a suspect or a victim or someone of interest in the case. The cool thing about DNA 
is that if someone doesn't match at a single one of these locations, even one number, they are excluded as a possible source. So now what we do is we compare all of these, we call these alleles. So a 12 is an allele, a 15 is an allele. We call this whole thing the full DNA profile and we compare it to the reference standard from the suspect or victim in a case. So does our reference standard one match our profile obtained from our evidence? No. So my job is super easy. I get to write a report that says so-and-so is excluded as a possible source. Done. So let's check the next person. How about reference number two? What does that look like? We got a match? Yeah. Right? Pretty cool. So um, a little bit about what we do once we have a match. It's a little bit harder, actually, when we have a match. Because if everybody had the same DNA profile, a match would mean absolutely nothing to us. It would not aid an investigation at all. The great thing is that we don't have the same DNA profile. So what we do is we take this profile and we put it into a population database that has known frequencies of the occurrences of these alleles. Put that whole profile in and it gives us a profile frequency. So when you guys watch like Law and & Order and all those shows and it says, you know, it's a 1 in 500 chance it's the guy, it's actually not correct. What our stat means is that the stat usually says something along the lines of um, the matching profile is one in 400 octillion individuals. Okay, that's how large our numbers are right now. And what it means is that if you had a population of unrelated individuals and you grab somebody at random, you would expect to see that profile X amount of times. So one in 400 octillion individuals. It doesn't mean that it's a one in 400 chance he's the suspect or one in 400 chance it's somebody else or something like that. And so that really gets misconstrued in court. So the defense attorneys love to kind of mess with that and try and get us to say something that doesn't really mean. But that's all it means. If you had a population of that many people, you'd expect to see it that many times, okay? So now we're gonna do the DNA activity, which you guys should have. So I actually have three case scenarios for you guys, um, something like we get almost every day uh, in our casework. And so you are going to fill out the DNA tables, and you're going to figure out who is included or excluded as a possible source. And then we even have a parentage for you to figure out if he is the daddy. Yeah? I'm guessing it's this. Yep, so a male is actually the sex determining, so it's going to be your X, X or your XY a lot of the samples that we get are very degraded, meaning that they've been left outside, they've been rained on, people have probably stepped on them, like cigarette butts and stuff. And so we don't get pristine, gorgeous profiles where there's information at every location. We get degraded ones, we have dropout, so you just leave it blank. Okay. And the way that it affects our job is that if we don't have all the, gen the genetic information, with less information, we have less areas to say that someone matches, meaning the statistic associated will be smaller. So instead of one in 400 octillion, it might be one in 400,000. Can you determine if two individuals are related from this? And you'll actually see we have a parentage one, and you can figure out if somebody is a, a parent. Um, there are statistics that can be done to see if somebody is a sibling, but we don't actually do that stat at our lab. So we can do parentage with both parents or with a single parent. Has anyone finished activity one? It's almost half, okay, so. Is James Dean our guy? Cigarette, probably the motorcycle grip, maybe. All right, let me see. I actually don't know the answer. <laughs> I have to remember which one this is. So someone said for the cigarette butt, it's very likely. 15, 16. Yeah, so James Dean definitely is associated with that cigarette butt, right? So the motorcycle grip. And what was your answer? You said maybe, right? Maybe. maybe. There are some spots that are missing. Yeah, so his answer is maybe. And maybe is a fantastic question. So of the genetic information that we have, does he match? Yes. However, we don't have all the genetic information. So in this case, I would say that it matches, and then I would give a stat that's going to be slightly lower than saying that he's the source. OK? And the stat would reflect that. Yeah. Oh, so being a homozygote instead of a heterozygote? So her question is, how, um, 
often do we see people have the same number at a single location? I mean, it can happen anywhere. So if, if both parents have the same number, someone might be a 1516 and someone might be a 1522, that option to inherit a 1515 is there. So yeah, we see them all the time. <laughs> If you have multiple suspects in a case and one of the suspects matches the evidence profile, do we continue to compare everyone else? And the answer is yes. So we treat every profile that we get independently. And in my report, even though I say that someone is the source of that DNA profile, I'll still say that these other people are excluded. Now that's different per lab. Some labs, maybe a source is enough. They don't have to list out everything that doesn't match either, but it just depends. I think the next one is what Randy Jackson, is this my microphone swab from, what do they do, The Voice? What's their show? American Idol, American Idol. yes. <laughs> Has anybody finished that table yet? We only have one? Okay, we'll wait. So the microphone one, do you guys notice anything about these profiles that seems a little different? What do you notice? Yeah, so her answer was that the locations across the top are different and there's no XY. And that's because this is actually a different kit that we utilize. So this is not looking at what we call autosomal DNA, it's looking at just Y DNA. And the reason why that's cool is only dudes have Ys. So in cases of like sexual assault, where you might have a lot of female DNA left behind and very little male DNA, we can actually target just the male DNA. The thing about a Y, though, is there's no other chromosome. You only get one Y chromosome, so you only get one number. So do you see that there's only one number? There's one location that there is two numbers, and that's because there's a duplication within that chromosome. Okay? And so Ys are actually pretty neat that you can target just those. The downsize to Ys is that all fathers, sons, and paternally related relatives have the exact same Y profile. So it's either your suspect or his brother or his dad or his uncle. All right, so based on their male DNA, whose male DNA is left behind? Randy Jackson. He's got some splaining to do. And something that you don't actually see in this exercise is these are gorgeous profiles. Like to make this exercise, we picked like pristine, nice profiles. We don't get this kind of stuff in casework. We get mixtures, we get three people in there, we get dropout, we get all kinds of stuff. And so we have all of these thresholds and guidelines and rules that we have to follow to interpret those. And it's super fun when you can like pull out a dominant contributor. So yeah, there's three people in this mixture, but this individual contributed more DNA or this individual contributed less. Um, so that part of the DNA analysis I find just like super fascinating and super fun to try and solve the puzzle and figure out, okay, what is the profile that I'm trying to get from this data? Homer Simpson, is he the daddy? And how did you guys figure it out? So if you look at these profiles, the way that we do this is if you take the parents' profiles, the child at each of those boxes should have one allele from both parents. So if you do that all the way down, does Bart have an allele from each of those parents? Yeah? Okay. So we actually get a lot of parentage type cases. Um, there are cases of, unfortunately, like statutory rape that we will get, and so we have to determine um, whether or not if, you know, a baby resulted from that, whether or not that person is the father. Um, so we do do cases like this. So criminally related paternal cases we will do. We don't do like Maury Povich where people just want to know if this is like their, their baby daddy. Like we don't do that, okay? <laughs> it has to be, the work that we do at the lab has to be criminally related. We only work on criminal cases. So on March 19th, 2000, nine-year-old Crystal Sedman was reported missing and was last seen with 19-year-old Thomas Soria Jr for TJ, and TJ was giving Crystal and two other little girls rides on the running boards of his blazer. So see these running boards here. And secret witness called police on the evening of March 19th, and they said that they had seen a vehicle and a person kind of fitting TJ's description, throw something in a gray bag over the side of Highway 50 um, near South Lake Tahoe. And so on the morning of March 20th, 2000, Crystal's body was found in an area described the, uh, by the witness in that secret witness tip. And so this is TJ Soria. Um, he was arrested three, after, three hours after the body was found and the blazer was taken into the crime lab and the apartment where TJ lives and with his parents was actually searched. 
And so this is um, red-brown staining on the floor of the blazer with a scale next to it. And the DNA profile from the blood found in the blazer matches that of Crystal Stedman. And so sperm identified on body swabs and, um, and DNA profile was developed from those, sorry. And the profile oddly did not match TJ. So you have blood in the car and this profile doesn't match TJ. So here is TJ's profile and here is the sperm fraction from the body swabs. So if you look, there's one allele at each of these locations that matches TJ, but the other allele doesn't. So what does that indicate to you guys? Someone speak up loud. A parent. So she's saying a possible parent, right? Because half of his DNA matches at every location and half doesn't. Siblings are a great question. You wouldn't expect with a sibling to have a whole profile like that. Siblings will have can have multiple areas matching, but the way DNA works, you can actually have, me and my brother share a lot. I looked at our profiles, but there are other siblings that don't share that much, okay? So what you notice is that because he shares at all those locations, they instantly thought, okay, we have to look at TJ's father. So March 28th, TJ's father, Thomas Soria Sr. was arrested, and here is Soria Sr.'s profile. Do we, do we have a match now? Yeah. So some closure in this case, on May 10, 2000, TJ pled guilty to kidnapping and bringing Crystal to his father and then disposing of Crystal's body. So this is a really sad case where TJ's father was actually utilizing his son to lure young girls um, and then he actually ended up killing Crystal. And then on January 28th, Thomas Soria Sr. was found dead in his jail cell and toxicology reports showed that he had died of an overdose. So instead of going to court, um, he actually never made it and died in jail. He was hoarding his uh, medication and then took it all at once. And then I'm going to just use this and we'll skip to the Brianna Dennison case. This one is um, the Brianna Dennison. Do you guys remember this? Yes, yeah. So this actually happened when I was in college here at the university. Um, a lot of changes happened on campus because of this case, actually. A lot of the polls you'll see around, like the emergency polls, they had, um, they gave out like rape whistles and stuff on campus. And so this actually was a huge deal within our community and something that I definitely remember. Um, on the evening of January 20th, 2008, 19-year-old Rena Dennison returned to her friend's home from an evening out with friends. And this is the house here. And Brianna had changed in her pajamas and took two blankets, a pillow, and a teddy bear from her friend before going to sleep on the couch. Her friend retired to her room and locked her door. The next morning, her friend awoke to find Brianna missing. And it was really weird because Brianna's cell phone, purse, and shoes were all still there, but the teddy bear was gone. And one of the blankets that she had used was actually on the kitchen floor. And then there was blood observed on the couch pillow cushion. And so a crime scene was collected that included swabs from one of the doorknobs in the house. And an unknown male DNA profile was obtained from those swabs. The profile was searched in the national DNA database called CODIS, and there were no matches found. The end result for DNA is, is kind of CODIS. We want to develop profiles that are eligible to go into CODIS and see if we can find a match. And the profiles that are within CODIS are um, profiles from people who have been convicted of felony crimes. And then as of 2014, because of this case, uh, Brianna's law was passed, and anybody now arrested of a felony crime also has to give a DNA sample. And so people that are convicted of crimes, arrested for crimes, and then unknown um, profiles that are developed from crime scenes can also go into CODIS. So an unknown blood stain from a crime scene can go in. So we have a lot of profiles in that database and it can be searched at a state level and a national level. And then if we had to, we could contact Interpol and do like European countries as well. They would do an Interpol search. That is not done very often. So they had no matches within CODIS for that doorknob swab. So what investigators started doing is they started looking at similar cases that occurred in the vicinity over the last few months. And so this is a map of campus. This is North Sierra Street. Here is, oh, this is kind of hard to see. There's a highway. And then I can't see what this actually says in between here. So what they found is that this blue arrow here on October 22, 2007, victim one was sexually assaulted in the parking lot here on campus. And then on December 16th, uh, victim two was returning home from her apartment near UNR campus when she was abducted and sexually assaulted. So here's these two. 
and then here's Brianna Dennison. So they knew that we definitely had very similar MOs and very similar crimes happening within the area of campus. And then evidence that had been collected from victim two and a male, uh, and a male DNA profile was developed from some of the body swabs. And then this profile matched the profile from the doorknob at the house where Brianna was abducted. So pretty much at this point, they knew that they had a serial rapist on the loose. And they also knew that at this point, it had turned to kidnapping. And so victim two gave investigators detailed information regarding the assailant's vehicle and his physical description. And then these are the flyers that most of you probably will remember. At the time when her body was not found, she was considered a kidnapping victim. And then on February 15, 2008, a woman's body was discovered in a field just uh, south of Reno. And the next day, the body was, in fact, identified as Brianna's. And so a DNA profile developed from Brianna's uh, body matched the previously developed from an unknown, the unknown male DNA profile from the door and from victim two. So here's the body swabs, here's the doorknob swab, and then um, another body swab here. This is victim two, and then this is Brianna. So they definitely knew that this individual was connected to all three of these crimes. Yeah? So it's a very good question. Um, you had a profile just like this in your activity. Her question is, why is there only one number instead of two? So what did we look at in the case pack in the packets that you did? Yes. So we targeted this is actually a Y profile. And so during the investigation, the Washoe County Crime Lab uh, Forensic Science Division actually processed 800 reference samples in conjunction with this case to try and find the suspect. It was a ton of work done on the crime lab's part to try and find this. We had people that would voluntarily give their DNA. We had, I mean, they just, they were submitting and submitting and submitting trying to find this. And so I hope this shows you guys that when cases like this happen, we do really drop everything and try and get this solved. Yeah. To exclude themselves, to try and help. The more profiles you get into CODIS, the more opportunity you have to get a hit. And so people either volunteered or if there was, Somebody in the community that maybe detectives thought were a little bit shady and they got them to volunteer their DNA, that was another way to get that um, compared to these profiles. Yep. And out of the 800 reference samples that were processed, there was no match. On November 1st, 2008, a secret witness tip came in to the Reno Police Department that 27-year-old James Bela might be someone of interest for this case. And detectives interviewed James and requested a DNA sample, but he went ahead and refused to give that sample. So on November 24th, a DNA sample from Vila's biological son was provided to investigators. The unknown YSTO profile matched Vila's son. And Vila's son at the time was very young, so that would be indicative that Vila is in question then. So on November 25th, 2008, James Vila was arrested. A DNA profile was then generated from James's reference sample, and it matched the unknown profiles. So here is the profile from victim two, the doorknob swab in the Denison case, the body swab, Bila's son, and then James Bila. And then on May 22, 2010, a jury found James Bila guilty on all five charges associated with the three victims. And on June 2, 2010, he was sentenced to death. On June 25, 2013, Brianna's law became Nevada law, meaning that DNA samples can now be collected from anyone arrested for a felony crime. So as of July 2014, we have been processing samples from anyone arrested for a felony qualifying offense. And that is the signing of the bill there. So other criminalist duties, you've already asked some questions about it, is obviously testifying in court. Um, we are required to testify, and like I said, any of those cases have the possibility of going to court, and whether those go or not, I just find out when I get a subpoena, basically, at work. And then we do a lot of stuff like this. I actually, we go out and we provide training not only to uh, the community, like kids like you, and to high school students, and I've lectured here at the university, but we also provide training for law enforcement agencies. So we'll go to the agencies and give them overviews of how DNA works, the type of samples that they should be collecting, how to process or how to submit them correctly to the lab, like what information we need for them to get their profiles in a CODIS. Okay? And then we also validate new techniques. So everything that we utilize in the lab, we actually have a whole ton of standards that we operate and run by. We are an accredited lab. And we have to follow all of these. And validation is a big key. So anytime new kits come out, anything that we use has to be validated. And it has to be validated a certain way. That's a big part of the job that I'm currently doing. And then continuing education. 
Um, I'm required, and as, as well as the other analysts, to do eight hours of continuing education every year. So we have to stay abreast and up to date on the techniques that are in the field. Um, and then casework review. So every casework that I do and my case packets that I put together, I have to give that to a second qualified individual who then goes through the entire case file start to finish and make sure that I followed all of my procedures, all of the rules, all of my thresholds, that they agree with all of the DNA interpretations that I did, and then they sign off on it. So that's a lot of work. So every piece of work that we do gets a second set of eyes and then actually a third set of eyes by an administrative review. So it's a lot of review that happens. And so you think you want to be an analyst now, right? Like I did this great talk. I did really good, right? Everybody wants to be a DNA analyst? Yeah. But here's some things that you have to consider. So um, a DNA analyst must have a minimum of nine semester hours or equivalent, so nine credits, of coursework covering the following subjects. And casework and or training in stats or population genetics. Um, if you want to be a DNA technical leader, this number ups to 12, and then three of those are required to be a graduate level um, course, okay? And then here's the pay scale. Um, so these are kind of the pay scales. I think these are a little bit old. Uh, criminalist two is about, taps out about 84, a senior criminalist about 89, and then a supervising criminalist about 95,000. And then you have to remember, if you want to work in law enforcement, whether you want to be a DNA analyst, or you want to work as a forensic investigator and go to the actual crime scenes, or if you want to be an officer, you've got to remember that you're going to have to go through a really, 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 really in-depth background investigation. So the decisions that you're making right now at your age will absolutely influence what happens down the road for you. So I am not joking when I tell you that they gave me a massive packet and they asked me all kinds of questions. They even went through my finances and wanted to know why I missed a credit card like payment. I mean, they are crazy in-depth. So, they will go over your drug use and then your criminal history. So they give you this packet, you fill out the packet, then there's like a multiple choice type Scantron thing too that you fill out, and then they ask you all those same questions in a lie detector test. So it's pretty, you're not gonna get away with it. You just wanna be honest, you wanna tell them everything, be upfront. So if I could do it all over again, what would I do and what would be my words of wisdom? I would recommend getting a minor in chem. Take as much chem as you can. Chem is awesome. Um, you know, if you don't want to go into DNA, but you want to go into toxicology, or if you want to go into uh, controlled substances, having more chemistry classes are going to be a benefit. Um, and then get to know your professors. You know, I got super lucky that Dr. Clark let me work in his lab. He was the only professor I ever talked to, ever. Like, really, I think he was like the only one that I ever went and like spent some time chatting with. I think I went to his office hours. And I was like, oh yeah, that dude has a lab. I'm gonna try that out, see if he'll let me work there. So think of the opportunities I would have had if I had talked to like other professors. And they're just normal people. I mean, go to their office hours, talk to them. There's nothing to be afraid of. I wish that I had done it a whole lot more. And then take full advantage of lecture series courses. And then the other thing is network. I was kind of shy. I still am a little bit but now they force us to do this kind of stuff, so you have to loosen up a little. Um, but if I had just spent a little bit more time like networking with people, and they have a lot of stuff on campus for like, um, you know, career fairs and stuff like that, just talk to people, ask them about their job. So and just be patient. Life doesn't always have like a, you know, a path that you have to go through. So does anybody have a question for me about my job? So her question is, what's the most difficult case I've ever worked on, either emotionally or work-wise? I would say I do a pretty good job of disconnecting myself emotionally from these cases. Everyone's different. Um, for me, it, I don't get very emotional over the cases. Some of the cold cases that I've worked, I would say that those can be a little bit more emotional, more on like a frustrating side of things. Like, you know, people have waited maybe 20 to 40 years for answers for something. And you know, 20 to 40 years ago, they didn't have the type of science that we have. So it can be frustrating working with old, degraded samples, for sure. Um, and you just, you know, you want to give closure to families who are left. So I would say that some cold cases are, are pretty, um, like, emotionally kind of frustrating. So that's a fantastic question. She's asking how long, how long a sample has been left out to the environment, or how old a sample is. Does that affect my presumptive testing? And the answer is yes. So on those older cases where there's really old blood stains, or let's say that the blood stain has been left outside, like a, maybe a body was found left outside for a really long time in the desert, absolutely. Um, you can see what is obvious to be like a big like blood stain where the person was like shot and bleeding, and you might get a negative result. It's just, it's just how much degradation has happened, how old the sample is, and that kind of stuff, yeah. 
I had a case once that I was working, it was a cold case, and I needed to process a blood stain. I took what I normally would take to process and expect to get a full profile, and I just didn't get one. And so I had to take larger cuttings to have more of that DNA because the degradation was so bad. Yep. So the question is, how often do we do cold cases? And if the agencies could, they would submit us a cold case every day to work on. Um, there's lots of cold, unsolved cases out there. However, we just don't have the manpower to do them. And so we kind of take them on case by case. And you know the reason for it, uh, the Washington County Sheriff's Office has a devoted cold case unit. And so they will send us cases. And it's kind of done by like, my supervisor will evaluate the case, evaluate what there is to process, and whether or not you know, she can assign it to a certain person. So her question is, do we ever receive training on how to manage our emotions or how to act properly? So it's kind of a two-part question. The act properly, we do get trainings on how to go to court. And that's a huge part of our training. We have to pass a pre-mock and a mock court situation. Um, and so they train us on like what our demeanor should be, the things that we need you know, to say, how to say them. Because you know, we're scientists, and we like the nitty gritty. We like the chemical components that we're working with and how it works and the reactions happening behind the scenes. But when you try and tell that to a jury person, they're not going to be able to understand all the time what we're saying. And so they give us a lot of training on how to explain these things to the general population. So a lot of that kind of stuff. And then when it comes to your emotion, I mean, yes and no. It's kind of like on the job. And every, like I said, everyone's different. And so they do talk to you. They do explain to you that, you know, this is, you're going to be looking at sensitive information. Um, with the crime scene guys, they started a new thing when you're being interviewed for those positions. They actually take you down and show you photos from crime scenes. And they evaluate your reactions to those. And every, like everyone's different. It's not a bad thing. It might not be the job for someone because they, don't, they can't handle that type of stuff. And just because some people can doesn't mean that they're not emotional enough. There's some people are very good at separating emotion from work. Yeah? So her question is, how much chemistry do I do in a normal day? Um, there's a lot of chemical reactions that happen in a normal day, but like having to know chemistry, not as much. Like I don't use mass spec or anything like that, but the toxicology guys, the um, controlled substances folks, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's what they live and breathe. If you like chemistry, you probably want to look into toxicology or, or, or drug chemistry. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks you guys for having me.